Hi, the aim of this video is to review some of the geological evidence for plate tectonic theory. It's crucial in that this is the evidence that was first used to devise uh, the theory of plate movement. Uh, and as such, it's well worth reviewing what the rocks actually tell us. Now, we're all very familiar with uh, a plate tectonic map of the world. For us, as geologists in the 21st century, the idea that the continents uh, are moving their position and have done continuously through geological time isn't a, a, a major intellectual leap. We know that there's a very secure basis of evidence, for not just for the plate movements we see today, which we can now measure extremely accurately using GPS technology, but also we can look at the evidence from the past of continents uh, joining, splitting, creating new continents, creating, uh, uh, splitting old continents. And we know this um, activity has been going on throughout geological time. We have a, a sound plate tectonic model, one that's still perhaps being developed in terms of uh, what's actually um, the driving force behind these plate movements. But I think we can be fairly secure in our understanding about that plate tectonics happened. One of the first pieces of evidence was a piece of evidence we call the continental jigsaw, fitting together what are now widely separated continents. Now, the simplest evidence for this is just the fit of the continents. If you take a world map, cut out the continents, you can sit there and, and reassemble uh, Pangaea, the supercontinent or one of the supercontinents, sorry. But if we look more closely at the geological data, we can start to match the geology of these widely separated continents. On the left here, we can see Africa and South America together, probably the most famous piece of um, evidence for plate tectonic theory. If we look at the rocks, though, you'll see from the Precambrian, we get um, these ancient lumps of continental crust called cratons. They fit together between Africa and South America. Now, the chances of that happening by chance are, are very, very small. Even more compelling is we see some of the orogenic belts, the mountain chains, that fit together across the two continents. Now, for the same tectonic stress to create a mountain belt on two widely separated continents at the same time, well, that's very, very difficult to accept. If the continents are together, though, it, give, it, it makes far more geological sense. We can even trace a whole set of mountains uh, down through the North Atlantic. The mountains we find in Greenland, in Scandinavia, uh, in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Newfoundland, the Appalachians in North America, and also on the west coast of Africa, are all part of the same chain, all part of the same tectonic stress event that folded uh, these rocks. So the mountains and these cratons give us some really good evidence. We can also find evidence from past glaciations. At the end of the Carboniferous, there was a very large glaciation. We find evidence of it in the form of um, tillites, uh, cemented glacial deposits, uh, also striations, scratches made on rocks by uh, moving glaciers. 
in Carboniferous rock or Precarboniferous rocks in South America, Southern Africa, India, Australia, and in Antarctica. Now, if you look at these places today, they've got wildly different climates. You know, the, con the climates of, of Southern Africa and India are very, very different, and totally different, again, from the climate of Antarctica. So how can these uh, widely dispersed places with such different climates, going from pole to the equator, have all experienced a glaciation? If we reconstruct the constants, though, from the Carboniferous, it makes sense. We see that there's a zone there of glaciation that would have affected all of these continents. We can even see from the arrows showing the records of, of glacial movement that this ice probably formed in a centre uh, in Africa and spread out from there. If we start to look at some other things that were going on then in the Carboniferous, we know the southern continents there were glaciated. Further north, though, we had a collection of continents around the equator. Notice Britain was in this location as well. And this is the location where the coal swamps were. This is where we find coal in the rocks. It's why we have coal in South Wales, as well as other parts of Britain. If we look at the distribution of these today, again, they have very different climates. They're in very different places. Notice there's even a little bit uh, of coal there in southern Greenland. But if we go back to the Carboniferous and see all of these places collected up in this band around the equator, it makes sense. The fossils as well give us clues. We can see um, Mesosaurus here, uh, an aquatic reptile, really a, a shallow water uh, animal. We find it in rocks in both South America and Africa. There are terrestrial animals, uh, Lystrosaurus, uh, Cynognathus, that wouldn't have been able to swim uh, wide oceans, yet we find them uh, spread around these um, southern continents. Also, we have uh, the fern, Glossopteris, found across South America, Africa, Australia, India, and even in Antarctica. This is one of the key bits of evidence that was actually brought back by Captain Scott on his expedition to Antarctica in 1912. The distribution of these organisms makes no sense with present day distribution of continents. It only works if we put those continents back together as they would have been when these animals uh, were living. So, to conclude, all of these bits of geological evidence relying on, rely on us piecing together disparate bits of geology, fossils, mountain chains, continental shields, coal deposits, that are spread out across widely different places, widely different climates now. Yet in the past, when they were together, that distribution makes sense. Now, it's not the only piece of evidence for plate tectonic theory, but I think it's an important one. Anyway, remember to come to class with your interesting question. I'll see you there.